Investors Chronicle. Companies and Market Show, 21st of December 2022. It's our last show of the year, ladies and gentlemen. We have had a great year podcasting with, with you guys and... Uh, yeah, we'll be back in 2023, uh, touch wood. But for now, Chris Aker is joining us. Hi, Chris. Hi, John. Good to see you. Hello. Good to have you here. Alex Newman as well. Hello, Alex. Hi, John. How are you? Very well. And Dan Jones, welcome uh, to our last show. What What is coming up today? Hi, John. Uh, today, we are discussing curries in our result of the week slot. They had their figures out uh, a few days ago now. Uh, some interesting things to discuss there. There is no uh, issue of the IC this week because we had our big bumper issue last week, but we do have a preview of a couple of bits coming out from the issue of the 30th, which Alex will be discussing with me. Uh, that is specifically the ideas of the week review and the stock screens review. So we will be digging into those. And then we're going to conclude on a, uh, a jolly note, which is why everyone is ill at the moment and what that can mean for certain listed companies. Yeah, that, that hits quite close to home in terms of our team, at least. Uh, before we get there, we would normally do a new segment, but this week, a special feature just because it's the final episode of 2022. And indeed, our colleague Arthur Sants, who writes on tech, has recently been writing about the rise of AI chatbots and asking whether AI is going to be replacing uh, humans' jobs in the near future. And we wondered whether 2023 would come around and would be replaced by AI. So I ran... Uh, an AI script simulator, and I uh, told it to write us a script of the company's market show. And before we get to our human show, here's what the AI came up with. Welcome to the Companies and Markets podcast. Today we'll be discussing the turbulence of 2022 and looking ahead to 2023. Joining me are Alex Newman and John Rogers. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Tanguy Tompkins was a new broker working in the firm's office in Hong Kong, and he had just had his FLO, which was fantastic. In his downtime, though, he wasn't having so much fun. Thoughts on that, Alex? I mean, well, you know that in any business, there's some turmoil along the way. But looking back on it, it seems to have started after a certain date. But what happened after that? Was it because of human error? Or was it because of something? Or perhaps we should ask ourselves if the market's fault really exists at all. Or is it just a reflection of our own screwed up economic situation? But instead of talking about trading fees, for example, maybe we should ask what, if anything, makes us human? You're probably right. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Any last thoughts, John? Well, I'll end on a question for today. What happens when all is said and done? We'll see you tomorrow morning. We can do another podcast tomorrow morning then, is that... According to AI. According okay. to AI. Well, my, my uh, interpretation of AI there, that script, is A, the, I'm going to take the positive interpretation, which is that our jobs are safe for now, mm. and not B, that is an accurate reflection of what we normally sound like <laughs> on the podcast. Yeah. I, I thought some of the sort of, some of the thoughts and the, the cadences were pretty accurate, actually. But yeah, I, I think your jobs are safe. We well, got the intro down and then it quickly went downhill with the made up <laughs> broker and things like that in Hong Kong. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get on to the, uh, the meat of today's show, the real uh, content. We are going to start, as mentioned, with Curry's uh, it's figures out a few days ago. Obviously, retail is not a particularly nice place to be at the moment. Uh, Chris... You wrote up these results. You analysed them uh, last Thursday, I believe it was. And there's a couple of things that, that jump out immediately. Uh, first of all, the big impairment charge, which came as a bit of a surprise uh, to people. Curry's obviously uh, said it took that uh, 500 million charge due to, effectively, to, due to higher guilt yields. You know, increasing the discount rate, which affected the the goodwill it had recorded. On uh, on previous deals, the Dixons and Carphone warehouse deal yeah, in particular. So so that came as a bit of a surprise, and there were some other uh, uh, things in the figures as well that weren't particularly particularly great. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Dan. So the goodwill impairment was the obvious headline: big chunky five hundred and eleven million pounds charge, as you mentioned, and. I guess this is just further evidence that higher rates are hitting valuations and this can cause pretty serious problems for companies. And yeah, that this charge dragged Curry's down to 
the statutory pre-tax loss. So quite a big deal for them. Um, getting on to the, the mix of the results. So while the impairment charge drove the loss, it was also quite a weak sales performance. Um, revenues were down 6% against pre-pandemic levels, down 10% in the UK and Ireland, uh, down by 4% in the Nordics. And it was actually only in Curry's smallest market, which is Greece, where sales went up. Uh, I think the story here is, as we've discussed at the IC and in many different areas, consumers cutting back on discretionary spending, in this case, discretionary, discretionary electronics spending due to cost of living pressures, real wages falling, inflation going up is not a, a pretty combination for retail spending. And there was a particularly weak performance in international cash profits. So adjusted cash profits for curries in international markets were down by 94%. Quite a uh, yeah, yeah, but the international uh, side does, uh, you know, contain some other some other bellwethers, perhaps insofar as I think Curry said some of that drop was driven by competitors discounting because they had too much stock, effectively, which is again something we've discussed as a risk this year. You know, the company's building up inventory to guard against supply chain issues right at the moment when demand drops off. And this obviously can hit those companies who have to take uh, the hit to their top line in terms of what they sell these products for. But as we've seen with Curry's, it can hit competitors as well if if consumers then naturally gravitate to those cheaper goods. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, as you said, Curry's pointed to competitors' heavy discounting of excess stock as the, the driver behind their weak international performance. And just to give some figures on that, so that Curry said that drove a 54% contraction in operating cash flow and a, a decrease uh, in free cash outflow of 86 million. So it's had a huge impact on their results. And as you mentioned, it's sort of, yeah, class, classic case of battling for market share, inventories going up and Curry's inventory actually went up 11% uh, as we had up to the Christmas period. So they're getting uh, in the clearly with well. retailers, a lot depends on the holiday period, you know, which we are right in the middle of now, you know, the retail sales figures over that time. I know you wrote about retail sales in general and the prospects for the, for the next few weeks, uh, the start of the month. Well, what's your sort of take on the outlook so far? I know Black Friday, for example, wasn't particularly great this year. How, how are things shaping up for the Christmas period? Yeah, as, as I said in that in that piece on retail spending, I think the outlook is, is still very challenging. Obviously, Christmas is traditionally a bumper period for, for retail companies. So Curry is, is expecting or would hope for a bump in, in sales as people sort of buy electronics as gifts, obviously. Um, but looking at the latest sales data from the ONS Office for National Statistics, it does show that volumes are struggling down pretty heavily as shoppers keep cutting back. And as you mentioned, Black Friday didn't really provide a boost, as one might have expected, to, to sales volumes. Uh, and this is sort of evident in, in Curry's results. Um, management have said the next six months aren't going to be easy. They've cut their, their forecasts. So management now expects uh, adjusted pre-tax profits for the full year of 100 to 125 million. And that's a cut from 125 to 145 million that they expected before. They're also planning to invest less. So CapEx spending is now expected to come in at 120 million. So the outlook as we had yeah, towards we, Christmas... We had some, uh, just good. this morning, I think some CBI trade survey data which for retail sales, which was better than expected. But I have seen some suggestions that on a seasonal basis, which is perhaps a more accurate tracking of official figures, that wasn't quite as good as it looked. Uh, the other risk with retailers, or you know, there are many risks facing them right now, are not not least the you know the the lack of demand or potential lack of demand as we have been discussing is perhaps some of the things that we've seen uh happen in the past 2008 and also in the summer with AO world which is these kind of hidden risks almost where you know even if a company's balance sheet looks all right it's a question of what suppliers are doing uh, AO world got into trouble early this year, didn't it, in terms of its supplies not being able to get insurance to deal with it. And that obviously then leads to a bit of a cash squeeze all along the chain. So so I think that's something people should look out for as well. Is that a fair assessment? Not to say that not to say that Curry's is necessarily going to face a cash call in, in the near future, but these kind of risks do come to prominence when times are tough, when recessionary environments emerge. 
Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, AO World is a good example. So that's a sort of pandemic winner for the share price since cratered. Um, and, and as you said, that badly hit in the summer when a credit insurer cut cover for the company suppliers with fears around falling sales post pandemic and also supply chain issues, which is a retail wide issue. Um, but yeah, it's been a very difficult year for retail overall, obviously with surging inflation, consumers reacting to real term wage cuts, um, trends of trading down to, to cheaper products and cutting back on spending. So there, yeah, there are plenty of negative stories in the retail space, um, obvious examples come to mind, like the collapses of maids.com and jewels over the last few months. But I think going back to curries to finish off, it is worth mentioning that we do have curries on a hold still. So we think it's valuation is still quite attractive, um, still a market leader in several of its markets and, and electronics. And I think long term, it's operating margin prospects still look pretty yeah, good. Just a question, we have question of weathering the storm for now. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Let's turn to our next section with Alex, Alex Newman, our ideas editor, looking at the ideas, how they've performed our weekly ideas this year and our stock screens as well. Uh, these two features will be in our 30th of December issue, as mentioned. Uh, let's start with uh, let's start with the ideas, Alex. How how have they gone this year? Obviously, it's been a very tricky year for markets. Tough year to generate alpha, if you will. How how have we done? Yeah. Um, so we've we've beaten the market <clears throat> this year by by one point four percent, which is pretty good, I think, given the year we've had. But I think there's quite a few caveats to um, that sort of headline figure. The, the first being that the buys, which is the majority of the the ideas we write because we're you know we're primarily trying to find ideas that people can invest in rather than short-term trading opportunities um uh were down both in absolute performance terms and also relative to the each stock's index so the average underperformance there was 0.5 percent which is not terrible but it's about you know it's kind of you, you sort of um reversion to the mean is 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 a bit inevitable there when you're you're you coming up with 86 ideas uh, in the course of the year. Um, but what, you know, what really worked for our ideas section this year in, in very qualified terms is our the bearishness. So the, the writers came up with a lot more sell ideas this year. And I think that's partly a reflection of, you know, the both the bearish sentiment, but I think there were at points they were quite obvious uh you know, as, as far as any invest, investing um, trends are obvious, uh, opportunities to either take profits or or short the stock. I mean, there's, there's complications with, with shorting, which we can sort of touch on a little bit. Um, but our sell ideas did really, really well. So they their average return was um, uh, was fourteen percent nearly. So when you compare that against the index. Um, for for those those picks, the average outperformance was fifteen percent. So, hence we've got the positive outperformance for the ninety eight ideas we did all together. Um, but yeah, obviously that's there's, there's a pretty big caveat in there. In that um, <clears throat> most of our ideas are down uh, are down for the year. Um, yeah, so those those are the sort of headlines. I suppose, you know, as you say, a lot of those ideas, they are long term in nature, which sounds like a bit of a get out of jail free card. But, uh, but you know, you'd hope for a, a decent timeline for some of those to come good as well. What were some of the maybe individual examples of, uh, I think, on the on the sell side, Amazon uh, as a particular, particularly fruitful sell call earlier in the year, for example? Yeah. So at the beginning of February, we uh, we wrote a uh, a sell idea on Amazon. I think by that point, its really high valuation was looking quite precarious against rising inflation, pressures on consumers, um, interest rates going up, and the discount rate that you'd apply to a stock, which you know at points in the last couple of years has traded on close to 100 times forward earnings, was looking unsustainable. So I, I, when, when I say there were obvious ideas, I don't think Amazon necessarily was, you know, it, any any stock idea is obvious, but for us that felt like a quite a clear sell case at the beginning of the year. As it proved, most, you know, highly valued US tech stocks at the beginning of the year uh, were were quite overvalued and their, their share prices have come down significantly. Um, 
but yeah, that was that was one example. And you know, if there if there are if there are kind of um, themes to some of our ideas ideas this year, um, that that is one maybe worth picking out because we've also had to sell ideas on Just Eat Takeaway and um, Ocado Group. Both are sort of well, all three are kind of part of the convenience um, sort of immediacy economy. So they they've 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 created business models which have really hammered the retailers that we were talking about in the previous section. But this year, I mean, being being you know being great at logistics has not been uh, has not really been a winner because there've been such cost inflation pressures on and even those sort of disruptor uh, retail businesses that that they have really struggled and their earnings are have, been, have really taken a hit. And in the case of Amazon, their you know their their international and North American um, uh, e-commerce businesses are no longer profitable. And uh, the, the last four quarters, at an operating profit level, have have um, have have been loss making. So with Amazon, there there's an increasing reliance on the the you know the the wildly profitable um, cloud computing division AWS, uh, and that's you know that's been the story of their success of the last ten years. But it, you know something here about their their investment case still doesn't quite add up, and they're going to have to turn the corner pretty soon because. You can't have the bulk of your, the bulk of your business um, uh, losing money and this increasing reliance on on you know uh, profitable but thinning margins from the the cloud computing division. So yeah, that was probably one of the standout ideas. Um, if if I was going to pick one this year, well, as well as ideas, uh, of course, you look after stock screens for us and the coming issue will also feature a review of those. Obviously, they are used as a as a starting point to to you know filter out some good some some suggestions for for investors again it's been a difficult year this year with a lot of trends reversing and changing course what what's the what's the general take on the uh, the stock screen performance this year yeah it's it's um it's a little hard to square against our um against our ideas of the week because you know they they've sort of they've kind of trended in line with the market um, or in the case of the cells, we've opportunistically managed to beat the market. I mean, the stock screens got really trounced this year. There was only one, one you know, very very speculative, highly levered screen which seemed to work. And even then, I'm, I'd probably put that down to a combination of luck and sample size. That um, you know, I, I would be surprised if it repeated its um, its yeah its run this year. I mean, across most investment strategies, it's been it's been very tough to beat the UK benchmarks, um, being the FTSE All Share, which, because of the the bias of the UK market, uh, particularly the top of the market, to resource companies and uh, sort of value stocks that have done quite well in this tightening environment. Um, it's it's a very hard it's a very hard benchmark to beat basically. Um, so value strategies have worked, but only if they've selected from those those resource stocks or or banks, for example. Um, growth as a strategy, which takes up quite a few of our screens, has has just been blown away because you know lots of those businesses was, were rated on you know quite keenly. Uh, momentum has occasionally worked as a strategy in some of our screens, um, but not that consistently and that's i think maybe a feature of how you know the sort of whipsawing markets we've seen so something that's in vogue very briefly and then all of a sudden it's um it sheds 20 20 percent uh on a on a poor trading update um so so yeah we've you know our stock screens you know this is my first year of running them as well um and you know up until you know, my taking them over, they'd done they had a sort of phenomenal decade. Uh I will say that, you know, I've tried to I've tried to stick to the experimental scientific rigor with you know with which they were sort of intended that algae sort of designed them to be. Um but yeah, just the picks from last year and the picks from, from this year just just really haven't um haven't delivered. Uh so so I'm interested to see how things are going to pan out over the next couple of years. My sense is that we will get a bit more dispersion in the returns and the screen, the screen success compared to the last decade, when actually most of the most of them had, had done very well. Yeah, I think that's fair. It will be interesting to see what happens there. And yeah, as a first year, a bit of a baptism, baptism of fire with the screens, but uh, I don't think we can doubt your uh, 
your commitment and your endeavours, <laughs> which is all of which is a way of me to uh, crowbar in the fact you are today wearing some Investors Chronicle socks. Oh, yeah. As, a, again, a demonstration of your commitment to the brand. That is, that's true, yeah. I mean, I, I think... Um, I think everyone was trying to wear something Christmassy today. And yesterday, our marketing department, I think they're obviously having an absolute mad clear out of all the crap in their uh, in their cupboards, uh, produced some Investors Chronicle. They're actually quite Christmassy uh, red socks, which um, which I, I saw from the label are 80% cotton, 17%... Uh, what's the... Um, 17% polyamide... And three percent elastane, so so a diversified sock portfolio. This is, this is for, how well... for any yeah for anyone who was asking for an asset allocation socks based asset allocation. Yeah, this is how well prepared you are. You've brought the tag. It, the well, it just it did happen to just just yeah to fall into my uh, the other bit of investors chronicle merch which I I got yesterday. Yeah, I mean this is it harks back to what we said earlier about excess inventory. I think as well. I mean I don't. Know. <laughs> I think all this stuff is quite a few years old when we apparently yeah. had money to burn on spending on making branded socks, which, you know, yeah. is an unusual marketing tool, but there we are. Anyway, I mean, hey, the, I mean, the, why, why don't we do an offer? I'm sure John would approve of a new on the off the cuff feature, but I think there are some more socks left. So the first, the first caller in <laughs> can have the an, first emailer have, in. The first emailer in. I mean, you do well to call into this podcast. <laughs> Given it, it won't go out for a day or two. Yeah. Well, yeah, there you go. There are some socks on offer as an end of year treat. What yeah. more could you ask for? Uh, speaking of the end of the year, though, we're going to end on a slightly more downbeat note <laughs> and discuss the fact that everyone appears to be ill at the moment. Uh, obviously, this is to some extent something we've gotten used to over the last few years, pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, this year you've got you've got a bit of COVID around. You've got seem to have a varying degree of respiratory illnesses, colds are back, flu. Uh, all of my nephews and nieces seem to currently have either scarlet fever or strep A or anything like that. They all seem to be okay, touch wood. But, but the, the long and the short of it is there is a lot of uh, things around at the moment. And there is an investment point to this as well. I mean, this both in terms of a company read across, but also even economically, I've seen some economists refer to this as a, a triple-demic this winter. Jen, our uh, pharma biotech correspondent, is here to discuss this issue, having also been slightly under the weather yourself in the past few weeks. Yes, it seems to have run through the entire IC team, actually. Mm. So you might have had some croaky podcast voices recently. Yeah, well, <laughs> part of the reason we didn't have an edition last week as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, maybe a bit of motivated <laughs> re reasoning discussing that this week. But, yeah, as discussed, I mean, there, there is a, uh, an investment uh, point here insofar as... The obvious read across for companies such as you know Halion, I suppose Reckitt, you know the companies making the kind of things that people will buy when they've got uh, when they feel a bit under the weather. In short, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're kind of dealing at the moment with what's being called a triple demic. So you've got COVID, um, you've also got RSV, very common respiratory virus that um, you know it's sort of affects healthy adults like a cold would, but um, children and the elderly are particularly hit hard. Um, and yeah, you also have strep A going around, not just in the UK. I think there's some evidence um, in the US that it's um, particularly virulent this year. Um, so as you kind of mentioned, on an economic level, this is going to cumulatively add up to a lot of missed work days in the coming months. Um, so there's a potential kind of macro um, impact there. Um, but more kind of directly uh, demand for over-the-counter medicines, so your strepsils, your lemsips, uh, is kind of through the roof um, at the moment. US pharmacy chains um, are reporting shortages of children's cold medicines in particular, um, which is, you know, if you're looking at it fairly cynically, this is quite good news for the makers um, of those medicines. And I think they'd already been anticipating uh, kind of a, a bump a year in these sales. Back in the summer, um, Rekord Benkiser sort of projected... Um, a long-term increase in the sales of their cold and flu products. And in the first half of the year, um, its health portfolio uh, has sort of surged, I think, close to a quarter. Um, so there's all, all the kind of evidence in the world that this uh, cold flu RSV triple-demic season is um, is worse than last year when um, a lot of places still had mask mandates in place and, and those kind of things. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely look out for... Um, 
Halian and Johnson and Johnson and Wreck It Ben Kaiser and kind of keep an eye on on their next quarterly results because, uh, yeah, it's all evidence suggests it's uh, it's going to be a big season for them. But on um, kind of a longer term level, uh, you've got to think about vaccine impacts as well. So Pfizer uh, and GSK are both um, working on RSV vaccines. We don't currently have a vaccine for RSV. It's a very very common virus. It can be very dangerous in certain populations. So uh, I think those are both sort of scheduled to launch next year and consumer awareness of vaccinations is going to be really high because of COVID. Um, So yeah, there's every chance that those are are kind of blockbuster potential vaccines as well. So you've got this shorter term, uh, people need cold medicine and we're, uh, yeah, there's, you know, it's flying off the shelves. You've got future vaccine demand uh, and then you've also got a a kind of macro impact. Keep an eye on on all those sick days and see what that potentially does to the economy. I suppose there's one the the counter argument and be a positive in terms of general health is that all this stuff could just effectively burn out and burn through quite quickly so you're just yeah. bringing forward the peak so that doesn't necessarily mean that sales are going to be strong for these companies over the you know months ahead maybe they're you know January, March quarter will be lower. Who knows? But it's in, when you mention the vaccines, it's interesting as well because perhaps part of the reason we have this uh, situation right now, speaking in my entirely unqualified medical opinion, <laughs> is, is that there is that kind of immunity deficit from the past few years when you know no one's been outside no one's been mixing to the same extent they would do at this time of year and now that is kind of coming back in you know with a bang yeah absolutely i think also there's there's not like a scientific consensus around how this is going to go as you said it could burn out relatively quickly or we could see kind of new strains circulating through populations people getting infected with things multiple times um yeah it's it's we're sort of a a human petri dish at the moment um to see how this is all going to work normally um i think these viruses um they tend to come in waves. So you might have a wave of RSV and things quiet down, then you get a wave of flu, but they all appear to be hitting at once, whether they kind of burn out and things go back to normal or um, whether they sort of stick around and you're seeing lots of reinfections uh, remains to be seen. So it's definitely um, definitely something to keep an eye on. Yeah. Well, as we said, it has been going around, it seems, anecdotally, certainly for at least a couple of weeks. Uh, so let's hope everyone's built up a decent amount of immunity before uh, the Christmas time and everyone gets to enjoy <laughs> a nice Christmas time recovering with their families. That does bring us to the end of the show and the end of the podcast for the year. So thank you to everyone for listening. We hope you have a, a good break and a restful time. And we will see you next year on another Companies and Market Show. Mm-hmm.